yesterday, today, tomorrow. My name is Mariana Cordier. I am your host, and I am coming to you from my home via Zoom. Valentine's Day is here, and today we will talk about the heart and how to keep it healthy. We will also discuss how to make couples and families stronger, improve communications, and handle conflicts better. The guests joining me today are Dr. Hutchinson, an area cardiologist, and Mariana Falconier. She is a professor and project director for Together program here located in Maryland. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I wanted to talk about Valentine's Day as something different, not about chocolates and cards and all that kind of stuff, but about our hearts. Uh, Dr. Hutchinson, Tell me about our heart. What do we need to do to keep it healthy? Thank you for having me. And I think there's no better time than Valentine's to talk about the heart because we need to have a healthy heart to be able to survive and live. And it's interesting, Valentine gives us a chance to think about ourselves, uh, what it means to really love ourselves and loving ourselves mean taking care of our heart, which is our heartbeat. So if I may take a minute, you know, for Valentine's just to talk a little bit about the heart in women, because so often I hear women talk about, well, you know, I don't think it's my heart. I think it's something else. And the reason for that is very simply that sometimes, like I say, women are special. We present differently, even in terms of heart-related issues. And so uh, one of the things I would like to just take a moment to talk about is just how different, especially for heart attacks, women can present. Absolutely. I would love for you to go into, you know, it's kind of a near and dear uh, topic for me because my mother, she has serious heart condition, but I can't tell you how many times she was having a heart attack and we didn't realize that's what was going on. Yes, and that's not very unusual because women, like I said, we are special, we present differently. When we think of heart attack, we often think of chest pain. And sure enough, there may be some women who have chest pain who can immediately go to the hospital and get attention. But the problem comes when there are women having heart issues that doesn't present with the typical chest pain. They may be short of breath, they may have marked fatigue, they may have shoulder discomfort, they may have shortness of breath, they may have abdominal discomfort. And so because they think because they're not having chest pain, it's not the heart. But what I like to say is if you are having a discomfort, especially if you get it every time you exert yourself, it's time to get it checked out. And what are things that we should be doing in general to be you know, better, you know, uh, heart healthy? Well, you know, we all hear the usual, know your numbers. That means we need to know what our blood pressure is. We need to know what our cholesterol level is. We need to know our BMI, which is calculated based on our height and our weight. We also need to be active. These are all the typical risk factors that we talk about in terms of heart disease. Included in that also is tobacco use. But there are other things that I tell uh, women and in general that we need to be better advocates and being better advocates mean we need to be in tune with what's going on in our bodies all the time. And I, I, you mentioned to me something about before the show, the importance of sleep. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because very often we don't associate sleep with the heart but I call sleep the sleeper of the heart because now we know that not having adequate restful sleep can cause various cardiovascular problems. But the question often is how much sleep do we need? Well, we all need at least six to eight hours. And you know, as, especially as women, we are such multitaskers, we're busy doing everything else and we never get enough sleep. So why is this important? Well, recent study shows that if you do not get that six to eight hours of sleep, it can lead actually to plaque buildup in the heart, which can lead to heart attacks. So right there and then we need to get enough sleep 
to minimize that effect. In addition to that, there are certain breathing problems that can happen during sleep, which can exaggerate sleep problems. The one that I like to talk about most is uh, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. We know about 90% of people who snore may end up having obstructive sleep apnea, and this can predispose, to, if it's untreated at least, to high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, different arrhythmias in the heart or irregular rhythms in the heart, and even worst case scenario, you can actually die in your sleep from obstructive sleep apnea if it's not treated. Well, you know, um, Mariana, I know that you're uh, going to talk to us about couples and stuff like that, but I think some of the issues that people have with sleeping is stress. And I know you're also <laughs> a psychologist. What it, tell us, how hard is it for some people to sleep and what can they do to be able to get good sleep? Well, um, it's very important, definitely, as Dr. Hutchinson was saying, like sleep, uh, sleeping well, sleeping enough hours. And that's the key aspect to um, decrease the levels of stress that we experience. But sometimes it's exactly stress what keeps us from sleeping many times. So, um, so that's what I work the most with uh, individuals, uh, uh, couples, how they, they manage and cope with the stress. and. The interesting part is that many of the things that we recommend are um, some of the things that Dr. Hutchinson mentioned that keeps your hearts healthy. So I think that you can do a variety of things that keep you healthy uh, physically, but also emotionally. Um, one of the things that stress does to individuals um, is that it has a tremendous negative effect on relations. So it creates this connection, distance, from those that could help us the most uh, deal with the demands of our everyday lives. And that's even more true these days when we're dealing you know, with so much um, isolation during the pandemic. So those, if we can connect well with those around us and maintain that bond is tremendously important. And uh, what stress does, the research shows clearly, is that it increases our irritability uh, we become more hostile, less tolerant, more impatient uh, with those around us. And that has a negative impact in our relationships. At the same time, it leads to more depression, more anxiety, but it definitely um, creates, um, you know, situations where we relate negatively with our partners. We argue more, we tend to be more emotionally aggressive. And um, some people go into more attacking styles and some others tend to end up withdrawing, trying to avoid those arguments. Either of the two roads lead you to this connection, lead you to um, more dissatisfaction and spending less time with your partner. So um, how, to do, how to go about that, how to fight stress. There are things that people do individually and most of the things uh, are what, you know, Dr. Hutchinson mentioned, you know, sleeping better, exercising, having good diets. I think that people, I usually invite them to have a very close look at what has worked in the past, what has not worked. And then there are a lot of, you know, uh, what we call more cognitive strategies. It's like, do I spend a lot of time thinking about the problems I have? Do I spend little time? And of course, rumination, which is just thinking and thinking nonstop in sometimes in a destructive way is not helpful. But many times, you know, there are some strategies that are helpful for a time, for a while, but not long term, or that they work for some problems, but not for others. For example, um, you know, if um, you, decide, you feel that getting distracted helps you deal with some problems, you know, if you're dealing, for example, with financial problems, you can easily see that that may bring some challenges over time. Oh, my God. I think like that is probably I do. I'm a lawyer on my day job and divorce. The number one culprit is the stress about finances. And, and you know, sometimes in a, in a couple, you have a saver and you have a spender. <laughs> and boy, can that raise your blood pressure. <laughs> So um, definitely, Dr. Hutchinson, um, what do you think about the stress factor? I think it's difficult to talk about stress without talking about technology. 
we all know technology is great, but I think technology can add to some of the stresses. You know, like in the last six to eight months, I think everyone thought at night when they went to bed that they need to have the cell phone, they need to have the iPad, they need to have the laptop just to be sure they don't miss anything. But the light, the constant light from all these equipment that we use, that can also uh, enable us not to have restful sleep. Because like I always say, the little substance in our brain that is produced to enable us to sleep well loves light, loves darkness, sorry. So when there's a lot of light around at night, the light from all the computers, the cell phone, the iPads, that also minimizes our, our, our that increases our the stresses that we have. The other thing I wanted to mention is the fact that we now know that stress can affect the heart. Uh, you have lots of people because substances are produced in our body during stress, and these substances can actually cause the heart to malfunction, where the heart doesn't pump the way that it should. And as these stresses are removed, this function can be regained. Gotcha. So Mariana, your Together project is about making sure uh, couples are communicating well and stronger. Tell us about it. Yeah, so um, I've been running this project for five years and now we got funding uh, for the administration of children and families to run it for another five years, uh, which is great. This is a free service for the community um, in the Washington DC area. And uh, couples are invited to join the program um, and be part of a workshop that is 14 hours long. And in that workshop, we integrate relationship and financial education. So we really use it, you know, the topic of money or financial stress um, to help couples learn how to manage the stress individually and together as a couple. Uh, we tell them, of course, about all the negative effects of the stress so that they can keep an eye on that. And um, we also um, show them some good communication tools, not just to talk about money, but about, about any difficult topic and give, we give them tools so that the um, communication discussions do, don't escalate into uh, arguments that are destructive for you know, their relationship. And then we, um, we also help them think about their relationship with money, uh, how each of them, as you mentioned earlier, manage money money differently, why that's the case, you know, and try to promote more understanding uh, rather than, you know, um, accusations or judgment about how the other does what they do um, with money. And then finally, we provide financial literacy uh, so that they can, so that's actually information to save better, spend better, plan better, manage credit better in the future. And um, we, the, the, the program has showed great effects um, that in terms of being effective in reducing um, depression, anxiety, um, stress in general about money in particular, and uh, improving um, the satisfaction with the relationship, uh, positive conflict resolution, uh, decreasing situations of emotional abuse, even regulating better our own emotions, and uh, of course, increases in um, financial literacy. People end up feeling that they know better how to handle their finances. So it's I amazing how many people don't know how to. I mean, it's it's not it's more common not to know exactly how your credit works or how to manage your finances. Um, so any financial literacy um, opportunity to learn is super important. Um, it, do couples that participate in your program, is it, are they charged a fee to participate or is it free? It, it is absolutely free because it's funded by this uh, federal agency. And on top of that, we also provide them with uh, gift cards up to $160 with, for, per couple, which can help many couples and for completing some surveys because we keep, you know, improving the program. And so couples feedback are very important. I would also say that the program, in addition, provides a case manager to each couple that connects them to uh, services that they may need in the community. So we do a thorough assessment of the needs that the couple and the family members that live with that couple, children or parents uh, need. And based on that, we try to connect them, particularly we connect them with employment services. 
We work with the county agencies that provide free employment and career support services. And, you know, that helps with the finances. And we really think that you cannot be just working on finances in a couple without addressing emotional um, aspects. And you cannot work just with emotional aspects when people are really struggling with making ends meet. So, um, and we, by the way, we do the program also in Spanish. So uh, the idea is to really reach uh, the communities in Prince George's County and Montgomery County. That's awesome. You know, we can't really ignore the pandemic, can we? Um, Dr. Hutchinson, what have you seen, if anything, uh, the, how the pandemic has impacted, um, you know, people with heart conditions or developing heart conditions? Well, I think the one thing that the pandemic did is that it prevented people from seeking help. And because a lot of people were afraid to go to the emergency room because they thought if they went to the emergency room, they will get COVID. And so they may have had symptoms at home that they just decided to treat with their own home remedies. And now that they are being seen again, we realize that they may have had issues back three months ago and now we're seeing the effects later on. So uh, in terms of heart conditions, we're seeing people presenting with late heart attacks, uh, people who also may have had asymptomatic COVID. Uh, they were never tested. We're now seeing them as all part of this long hauler group where we are seeing them now presenting with late complications like increased clots in, in, the, in the veins or in the lungs and also inflammation in the heart muscle. So uh, late presentation we saw with uh, worsening heart conditions from those who didn't want to seek help. And the other thing during the pandemic, some people were just afraid of the whole telemedicine and did not have access and may not have been able to communicate with their doctors. So we saw a lot of different uh, effects of the pandemic as a whole on different populations. And uh, for those who, who may have been asymptomatic, or what are some of the symptoms that they should keep an eye out for just in case? Are they the same or are they different? Well, they, the, now what uh, we may be seeing is people presenting with shortness of breath or even arrhythmias, uh, sometimes palpitations. And like I said, clots in the lungs, clots in the legs, swelling in the legs. Uh, a lot of other problems that we saw during the pandemic with people had to develop uh, degenerative problems where people working at home, they just sat a lot. And so now they having lots of joint discomfort. But it's one thing that we're seeing now on the back end that COVID initially we thought it was a respiratory, it did affect the lungs, but now we're seeing a lot of other organs that are, are being affected uh, in the long haulers from COVID, whether it's the GI tract, the nervous system, the heart, uh, the muscles, the nervous system. So a lot of different systems now that we've seen as a result. Of and Mariana, with regard to, to the pandemic, how has that affected couples and, and their interactions and being so close together <laughs> in the house? <laughs> um, I think that no one these days can deny the effects of the pandemic on our own individual emotional well-being and the relationships with children and with our partners. Uh, for some, it has uh, provided moments to get connected, to be closer, but for many couples, and that's the majority, where there are always issues of some kind, the pandemic has simply exacerbated those issues. And in some cases, we know that it has become a very dangerous and risk, um, a situation of risk for many couples where they were, you know, close to engage, you know, in some kind of, you know, physical um, abusive behavior or even psychological. I mean, the isolation, the, the length, the long hours spending together and the increasing demands uh, from having perhaps children in, in the home or all family members think about multi-generational households where now we're all together in a very small space, you know, dealing with each other <laughs> with, uh, all day long. Um, this is a tremendous demand emotionally for any human being and it does have an impact on relationships. So um, 
this whole idea of learning to create a space for you and create a space for others and manage the time in a sort of artificial way, because we always know that when we go to work, you know, this physical change of a space really help us psychologically produce differences. This is work, this is the time at home, this is the time with my partner, all that is blended now. So it requires to be more intentional about some separations. And not everybody plans and sits down to do this. So uh, at the end of the day, most people feel exhausting, not wanting to spend more time we know a significant other, but rather willing to take a break. And I would say, I would say to everybody, um, be compassionate with yourself and with your partner and with the relationship. This is not the time under you know, abnormal circumstances. It's not the time to judge or evaluate quality of a relationship, what you want to do in the future. This is more of a time of finding mechanisms and strategies to cope, you know, to move on and trying to minimize the negative impact that all of this is having. And I want to go back to what Dr. Hutchinson was saying before about the impact of all the technology in our everyday life. I think this is a great challenge and this is gonna be the challenge beyond the pandemic for all the generations that have been born in this sea of different you know, devices and multitasking and what it's doing to our relationships. I mean, of course, limiting time or learning to create a space without those devices in between is amazing. Uh, is that what we really needs to be happening? And I have uh, teenagers in my home and, you know, they communicate with me within the same house by phone, texting me, you know, and for a generation like me, I'm 50 now that was born without cell phones or all these, this is, you know, it's very difficult for me to handle. So I stand up and go to their rooms and still talk to them. And, uh, but I'm beginning to see that, you know, it's difficult for them not to do that. So I'm trying to figure out what are the moments in which we can keep the technology out of the, you know, our relationship. So when we have dinner, when we are driving sometimes in the car, when we are watching TV, because really we're watching a movie together and they still have their phones on and they are watching the movie with us and at the same time texting. And, um, and so the other piece that Dr. Hutchinson was mentioning is like being in touch with your body. I don't think the technology, unless you are taking a yoga class or a mindfulness activity, the technology by itself it doesn't allow you to be centered and being you know, grounded and in contact, aware of what's going on for you internally. So I think we also have to be more purposeful about that. You know, Try to carve out time during the day where you either do relaxation, some breathing activities, or something that you know, removes you from all these um, continuous buzzing from the technology around us and make us you know, look inside and be more thoughtful and reflective rather than to be carried away by the technology all the time. What do you think, Dr. Hutchinson? I was just, I, I was just amazed uh, in terms of the relationships during COVID. I was going to ask Dr. Falconia how, um, if there was an increase in the amount of abuse uh, in, in couples or in between children and parents, and she can comment on that. I was very interested in that. Yeah, there has been, I mean, basically what we know is like we are getting, you know, statistics from, you know, um, the agencies that deal with domestic violence in the country or with, uh, and what we are seeing is that an increase definitely in, you know, uh, calls and consultations in therapy Regard, related to domestic uh, abuse, to situations of violence in the same way that we have read also in the media, more and more articles talking about the increase in depression among adolescents. So, um, and there are more articles coming out every day about the effects on the pandemic on our psychological well-being. But um, definitely, I think it's not surprising at all, you know, because the conditions have changed and. The other piece that we need to add is how, for how long this has been going on. You know, um, I think that that adds um, to the stress and the uncertainty of when exactly um, we can recover some of the ways in which we were doing things earlier. 
Um, I think that for the children and the teenagers, um, all this online connection, you know, is going to have tremendous consequences. And with regard to the domestic violence and abuse piece, the fact that the children used to be able to go to school to get away from maybe abuse in the home and the schools are mostly virtual, um, so they're still in the homes, it makes it really hard for those that use that, you know, component to be able to report abuse or to get away for a while at least. Um, and I can't imagine that the financial aspects of uh, all the households where they have one or two parents who have lost their jobs or their work has been furloughed or um, the impact on the finances uh, can't help at all in those homes where there's uh, domestic violence. Um, so Mariana, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> we got about a minute left. What's the last thing you want the uh, audience to know? Well, to try to remember that this will come to an end, at least the way we're living right now, that, uh, and that's, you know, that give us hope, particularly with the vaccination, everything that's going on, everything that Dr. Hutchinson has, saying, has said about taking care of yourself, um, of your heart, of your body, will have a tremendous impact on your emotional health, but you also need to take te steps in taking care of your emotional health and think that a lot of the things that in the past we did naturally, now we have to be a little bit more intentional, intentionally about them until conditions change. So keep in mind your relationships all the time and whether what you are doing helps them be, um, keeps them healthy or not. Think of the relationships as another organ that you need to take care of as well. All right, that's awesome. And I'd like to uh, wish you guys, my guests for joining me, a happy Valentine's Day. We're out of time, that's it. I would like to thank our audience for watching and don't forget you can catch us on YouTube as well under Yesterday, Today, Tomorrow's Show. I'm Mariana Cordier, until next time. Mm -hmm.